Salute to a Broken Bed, State College, Pennsylvania, 1969. There it was in all its glory, a sagging mattress with busted wooden slats protruding out from all angles, as if wild animals had wrestled on it. Bud peered over my shoulder into the bedroom to survey his work once more, then swaggered John Wayne style into the kitchen to grab a bagel. He thought it was hilarious. Some night, doll, he said, giving me a quick kiss and a pat on the butt. I could tell he was still thinking about the previous night. He was a legend in his mind, and I could already hear the talk. From Navy buddy to Navy buddy, the story would grow with each re relished retelling. Bud would be a stud, and oh, I would be stud totally embarrassed. I pursed my lips. Don't tell anyone, promise. I was thinking of buying a billboard to announce this event. A huge photo of the broken bed. He quirked his eyebrows, signaled that he could tell that he was this wasn't going well for him. But he continued, hmm, I got to think of a catchy phrase to put on the billboard. I have a catchy phrase for you, I interrupted. If this gets out anywhere, you're dead meat. Still smiling, he pushed his luck. I bet I could sell that photo to a betting store. They could use it for a mattress ad. I wasn't finding any of this funny. Okay, it was pretty funny. Our first night and our first home together, and the results were, well, not something you would play whisper down the lane with. We could laugh about it in private, sure, but if this got out to even one Navy person, it would spread like a virus. These were the people who would be at our wedding in a few weeks. I imagined the looks. I could hear their snickers. I imagined walking down the aisle past the Navy guys while they only half-heartedly tried, tried to conceal their grins. But, no answer. I repeated a little louder. Bud! Still no answer. I yelled, hey, stun! He turned towards me with the same shitting, shit-eating grin he'd been wearing all morning. I should have let him enjoy it, but I needed to get ready for class. More importantly, I wanted to get some expectations from Bud before he went to his 10 a.m. training class with all his Navy buddies. I want you to promise you won't tell anyone about this, I pleaded. His face fell. Aw, doll, it's too funny not to tell anyone. I'm bursting to tell someone, please. He moved close to me and started kissing my neck. Just when I began to chafe at unfair this boy was, my resolve started to fade. He knew exactly what he was doing. He crocked an eyebrow at me as if wondering, has she changed her mind yet? Without a single word, he won the battle. I concede him. Okay, tell Dennis, but swear him to absolute secrecy. I would die of embarrassment if this got, gets out. Please promise me this doesn't get any further than Dennis. I trust him not to spread the story, but please, bud, please promise me. Sure, doll. He made a victory punch in the air. Promise me, I pleaded. I need to hear your promise. Please. I promise. Not a word to anyone. I don't kiss and tell. He zipped up his mouth with two fingers and gathered his gear for class and training. Come on, we're running late. Get a move on it. To bud late meant arriving less than 20 minutes before the start of any particular event. And 15 minutes before class started, that was late for him. But given my last minute thrashing, I figured it wasn't the worst habit he could have. So I hustled to get my book bag packed. Minutes later, we were out the door, bagels in hand. As we drove to campus, I reminded Bug, I have my dissecting lab this afternoon. They're bringing a cadaver in this morning. 
He turned the Mustang into the student parking lot, found an empty spot and glided to the stop between adjacent cars. He cut the engines and shot me a serious expression. Now you need to promise me something. He paused for dramatic flair and then continued. Please don't touch me until after your lab, until you take a shower. The whole idea of cutting up a body grosses me out. You got it, I promise. I crossed my heart and got out of the car. What do you think we should do about the bed? Let me measure the bedroom. <coughs> <coughs> we can go check out mattresses later. Then, holding back a smile, he teased. It'll have to be a strong bed. Yes, a, a very strong bed, I laughed. We walked together and paused at the fork in the path where I kissed him goodbye. Then we took our opposite directions. After a while, I heard Bud yell from a good distance behind me. I sure do love you, doll. I turned to see the back of him at full tilt run to his class. I looked at my watch. He had 23 minutes to get to class, which meant in three minutes he'd be late. It made little sense to me, but I took it on faith that my little quirks were just as odd to him. The morning ran its course quickly. My first class flew by, but I struggled to stay awake during the second, but I lucked out though. The prof must have made his outline from his lecture directly from the textbook. Taking notes would be a simple matter of checking off the points on my outline. After two hours of studying in the library, my last class of the day was my dissection lab. My heart pounded with excitement as I pulled on latex gloves, smock, and safety glasses and took in the day's lab instructions. The faces of the others were flushed with excitement too. The real world culmination of so many years of book work. On a metal table lay the dead body of a man about 50 years old. The instructor informed us that our goal was to move the mate major organs, weigh them, and store them in formaldehyde-filled jars. She demonstrated a clean cut with the scalpel. We knew the soft tissue would decay, so we removed those first. I lifted out the liver, noting its sea sponge appearance. I had no doubt this man died of cirrhosis of the liver. When the, all the organs were removed, the instructor asked for the cause of death. I looked around at the blank faces and blinked back happy moist eyes when I realized I was the only student with the correct answer. <coughs> After the lab, we rolled the cadaver into the refrigerator unit, washed up, disinfected ourselves, and removed our gear. I packed up my stuff and left the, cas the classroom. Outside my lab building, Bud and Sam were waiting for me. I attempted to hug Bud, but he winced and ducked. I chuckled and held up my arm for him to smell the disinfectant, and he reluctantly hugged and kissed me. I thought to myself, my new perfume owed the dead. Sam, on the other hand, picked me up in a big bear hug, only to pull back panic-stricken as though I were made of porcelain. Did I hurt you? He shrieked. How's the baby? I won't break, Sam. Relax. The baby's fine. Someone tells me this is a boy, Sam jerked a thumb at Bud. I think Bud determines the gender of this baby, I winked at Sam. He's sure he made a boy, we'll see. How are you feeling, Sam asked. Um, I get tired. There are times the baby doesn't like what I eat. He rejects the food and I lose my cookies, but otherwise we're doing great. Sam turned to Bud. You're one lucky guy, does she have a sister? No, she's a one of a kind, Bud smirked, smirked. But be careful what you wish for, Sam. I never know what to expect. She caught me. I squared my hands on my hips and fixed him with a mock scorn. You chase me like a tomcat. Oh, come on, doll. You set a trap for me early and I got caught, he teased. Right, you chased me around campus. Every time I turned around, there you were. All those, quote, accidental meetings were done on purpose. You planned them all. Every time I turned around, there you were. Could I help it? You were always where I was. I glared at Bud while turning to Sam. 
Don't believe him, Sam. He's so full of shit. You guys settle this. I better run, Sam said. I have a class to teach in 15 minutes. Watching Sam walk away, Bud said, that man is trying to steal my girl. You're my doll. That'll never happen. Once a man breaks a bed with me, I'm bound it to him for life. I reached up and traced the curve of his ear. You're safe. Sam doesn't want me. He wants what we have together. Bud circled my waist with one arm. You're right, but the bed. We need to fix that. As he walked next to me, he sang off key. When I fall asleep, I never count sheep. I count of the charms about Linda. I gave him a puzzled look. It's Buddy Clark, he said. I shrugged and matched his stride while he continued to sing. As he opened the car door, he sang the last line of the song. With one lucky break, I'll make Linda mine. In the car on the way home, I marveled at the fact that we had our own home. Granted, it was only a little trailer, but it was a welcome upgrade from the confines of the Mustang, and it was ours. More than just the obvious limitations of having sex in the back of a car, the trailer gave us an escape. The campus was always crowded. Trying to find a quiet moment in the bustle of the dorms was impossible. Eating in a dining hall with a hundred fellow students was hardly intimate. We always had people around us. The trailer, though, was where we could be alone together. The trailer had a living room, a kitchen, a bathroom, and a small shower, a guest bedroom with a twin bed and a master bedroom. The disaster that awaited us in that master bedroom resurfaced in my mind. We'd have to use the twin bed until we replaced that mess. I awoke from that thought to see our neighborhood through the windshield. Soon the trailer itself was just a few feet ahead. Bud parked the car, we gathered our things and went in. Bud's weights aligned neatly along the wall in the narrow hallway. An old coffee table came with the trailer, was against the wall and on it, Bud's stereo. We didn't have much else. Our kitchen cabinets were empty, except for a cheap toaster and a few kitchen items. Filling them would be fun, but expensive. I exited the bathroom to find a shirtless Bud sitting on the sofa. The sofa was too small for him. Everything in this place was small, but it was what we could afford. He was rifling through documents. He said, aha, I knew it. What? A schematics of the, of the trailer. He held up a paper. No need to measure the bedroom. The dimensions are on the floor plan. Let's buy a new bed. Give me, a, give me five minutes, I said. But second-guessed myself when he stood up from the sofa. His muscles flexing with the movement. Ah, oh, what a body my man had. But we had to buy a bed, I reminded myself. Put your shirt on. Carefully, I maneuvered around the bed disaster, grabbed a heavy sweater, and changed my shoes. No time for the promised shower. The stores would be closing sooner. Later in the bedding department of Sears, Bud pulled out the trailer schematics, comparing the size of the mattresses to the size of our bedroom. His eyes twinkled. A huge smile lit up his face. We have room for a queen-size bed. We were tall, so we wanted the biggest bed that would fit, but that wasn't the only reason. Bud grinned devil devilish, deviously, and I could tell, almost see the wheels turning in his he-man mind. A queen-size bed equals an oversized playground. Are you sure, I asked. That looks like a big mattress. Will it fit in the bedroom? Bud once again compared the sizes and once again confirmed it would fit. It still looked too big, I thought to myself, but numbers don't lie. Might be tight on the top and the bottom, but there should be a foot of walking space on each side. When the clerk explained the features of the mattress, I could tell he was on commission. Bud wasn't listening. He was analyzing the, analyzing the bed construction, reading the write-up from the manufacturer, and inspecting this mattress set thoroughly. Pulling a pen from the pocket, he folded the schematics in half and started a list. 
He examined the construction of the frame and scribbled on his list. He continued like this until he, his list was long and detailed. Do you like this mattress set, he asked me. If I expressed the least amount of doubt, I knew he would explain all the positives and negatives on his list, which would take at least 45 minutes. If his negatives outnumbered the positives, he would start all over with a different mattress set. I saw this turning into an all-night marathon. To me, all the mattress sets were the same. They were different in color or puffiness, but any set would be fine with me. Sleeping on a bed, a broken bed, on the other hand, was out of the question. I was hungry and tired. The twin bed and the trailer sounded like heaven. I didn't care which mattress set we got. I trusted Bud had trusted Bud to figure that all out. <clears throat> I announced, announce, I like it. Bud smiled broadly and stowed his pen and paper, pen and paper. The salesman asked if we wanted it delivered for fifty a fifty dollar fee. Bud turned to me. Do we want to be pay for delivery? He thought, and before I could answer, said, I could haul out the old bed and pick up the new one. One of the guys has an old truck that I could borrow, and I don't need to tell him anything except we're moving. I considered our meager finances and nodded. It's probably foolish to pay 50 bucks for delivery when you can do it for free. But I knew doing it ourselves meant help from our friends, and I didn't want strangers in our bedroom to see, well, the disaster of our bed. If Bud could manage this project discreetly, then I was all for it. A queen bed of our own, it occurred to me we'd need sheets for Bud's new playground. So I said, you finish this, I'm going to pick up queen sheets. Then I wandered off to search for linens. What do you think of our bed, he asked on the way home. We own a bed, how domesticated we are. I think you picked out a great set and queen size too. Do you have big plans? You bet, doll. He shot me a side glance and a, whisk, a wink. I thought of our new territory and got an idea. Are you hungry? Uh, there's nothing in the refrigerator yet, doll. We could stop somewhere. I think we should have a picnic, I announced. It's too late for a picnic, don't you think? I checked my watch. Nope, not too late. Pull into the grocery store. We should make it just before it closes. He shrugged. Okay. The grocery store would close in 15 minutes, so I rushed from aisle to aisle to get what we needed. At home, we spread a blanket on the living room floor and lit candles. Bud put on my a favorite Petula Clark song, I Know a Place on the Stereo, while I arranged an assortment of salads and sandwiches on paper plates. Nothing but the best for this event. Plastic utensils. On an old army blanket, we shared our first dinner. It was only a picnic on the living room floor, but we owned that floor. The most expensive restaurant couldn't match that. When I returned home from my Friday morning class, an old pickup truck backed up was backed up in our driveway. I expected Bud to be playing racquetball with Dennis, but the two guys were carrying out pieces of our bed to the to the pickup truck. Propped up the side Against the side of the trailer was our new mattress set. I counted the number of men working to carry out the bed, old bed. There should have been only two, Bud and Dennis, but I counted four. <sighs> Bud looked at the ground with a sheepish half smile and shrugged. I kept my promise, doll. Really, I did. I didn't tell them about the broken bed. The guys kind of showed up. Bud's backup guy, Dennis, leaned over and whispered, I didn't tell either. Right, I said, arms folded. They were all sweaty and working, so it was a hard time remaining upset with either of them. Still, I decided to enjoy letting them sweat a little more while I listened to them try to recount the day's events. Bud's explanation matched his left-brained idea practical. The Navy friend with the truck lived near Sears. He volunteered to pick up his bed. His buddy came along to help. All very logical to him. 
Behind me, two women called to their husbands. After a morning shopping, they were stopping by our trailer to offer their help. Ah, oh, the word was out. More Navy people showed up until we had what could only be described as a party, a bed removal party. I watched it unfold and shook my head. There was nothing I could do, so I decided to roll with it. Wives arrived with bags of kitchen needs. They weren't new, but rather extras from their, their kitchens. They washed, washed and arranged the various items into our cabinet. I grabbed the dish towel to help. I hadn't even owned a dish towel, but I did then. Women ironed and hung white curtains in the kitchen or living room. We didn't own an ironing board for that matter. But when the commotion of generosity cleared, our cabinets were full of mismatched pots and dishes. The ironing board sat in the closet, curtains hung on the windows, and our new bed sported a donated bedspread thrown neatly over our new sheets. While I counted the sets of dishes, Barbara made a surprise stop next to me. I instantly remembered her, the grand inquisitor from my first Navy party to German if I was good enough for Bud. You did all this, didn't you? It wasn't a question. I knew it was true. I put down a kitchen gadget to hug her. The Sunoco station had dishes for 99 cents when you fill up the gas tank, Barbara said, as she pulled out, pulled out of my hug. The guys got those for you. They overdid the number of sets, 23. Except for the dishes, none of this is new. It's just a start. You can replace things gradually. Wow, thank you, I managed. It's nothing. You're Navy now. We have your back. Barbara pointed her index finger at me sternly. You better not hurt him. I recoiled slightly but laughed and sighed in relief. Nothing to worry about, Barbara. I promise I'll never hurt him. I love that big guy, I assured her. Her lips pursed for a moment while re she reconsidered. Another test? I wondered, maybe? Probably reading my mind, she wrapped me in a big hug. When all the work was done, a spontaneous spot, a party spontaneously started. Kids ran around our small yard. Someone went for beer, soda, and ice. Someone else ordered pizza. Couples began swinging to a Jerry Lewis number. Jerry Lee Lewis number. Navy men stood around the old pickup truck drinking beer and teasing Bud. Heads turned periodically to inspect the mangled contents of the bed in the pickup truck. The monument to Bud's virility. They toasted our demolished bed, then raised their glasses again to toast my Bud. I couldn't hear the words, but Bud was blushing. I had never seen him blush. How bad are they teasing him, I asked Dennis. He's getting the full treatment. It's all in good fun. They're digging for details. Don't worry, though. He's not telling anything. I know. I did, and I did know. My bud, even he knew where to draw the line. A large sedan pulled into the next driveway, making me worry we were making too much noise for our new neighbors. An elderly lady with a cane and a grocery bag and bags in the other ambled slowly to her trailer. She struggled and dropped her bags on the walkway, and there was my bud, picking up all those groceries and rebagging them, then running them to her door. The music changed to a swinging big band piece by Glenn Miller in the mood. The elderly lady bounced up and down to the music. My sweetheart started to dance with her. I looked around me to find that I wasn't the only one watching Bud. Always supporting her against falling, he did all the dancing, weaving back and forth around her. There in the middle of his dancing, she bounced and sang, her face glowing. When the music ended, he bowed to her and kissed her hand. She smiled at him as he slowly escorted her into her trailer. Then he, then he returned to the party. Soon she opened her window and sat watching us, enjoying our craziness. When she caught Bud's eye, though, she blew him a kiss. 
Oh my, I have competition. I couldn't help but giggle. The impromptu party ended with hugs and well wishes. A mass of cars and trucks rolled their way out of our trailer park. Except for a few paper plates or cups, the trailer was cleaned up. It was an amazing transition. Our trailer was a real home, our cozy home. We had everything we needed. I found Bud standing in the hallway outside the bedroom admiring his day's work. Bud needed to do that for the hallway because there was no space to walk in the bedroom. The new bed took up the entire floor space, wall to wall. I don't think this bed fits, I said. We won't be able to use the closets or the drawers. The bed fits in here, doll, he assured me. Let me show, show you how this worked. He started by demonstrating our built-in drawers. I sat in the center of the bed to watch. He got on the bed, crawled on his hands and knees to the drawers and sat cross-legged on the side of the bed. He opened a few drawers. See how easy? He peeked in one of the drawers <coughs> and turned to me with a devilish grin. He pulled out one of my bras. He wrapped the strap around his finger, then twirled the bra in a circle over his head. I lunged to stop him, but his long arms easily yanked it out from my reach. I pushed him down on the bed to wrestle my bra from him. He laughed and let me have it. Then continued his demonstration. He was on a mission. He crawled on all fours to the closet and again sat cross-legged on the bottom of the bed. He slid the door open. With no floor visible, Bud stepped directly into the closet. See, it's easy to get anything from the closet, he said. Plenty of room. No problem. Bud closed the clo sliding closet door on himself, and I could hear him struggling to pull something from the floor of the closet. His head banged on the closet bar, and he crawled back out, holding his head. He repeated the process on the other side, a new approach. Something was blocking him from setting, stepping inside the closet, but I couldn't see what it was. From a seated position on the bed, he struggled to lift something on the floor. I hoped it was some kind of bed compressor to make the bed smaller. Finally, he pulled out a large object tied with a red bow. I wrapped this, but the box made it too big to hide. I had to take it out of the box, he said. Look, he charmed, holding a white cupola with a little black roof. His index finger spun the rooster on the top. My bottom lip started to quiver and tears filled my eyes. Oh, let me sh show you this, he said. He tipped the cupola on the side. Under the eaves of the cupola's roof was a brass plate. It read, I sure do love my doll. He remembered. He hadn't even known what a cupola was, but he promised I would have one before we got married. I put my hand on my mouth and cried. You like it, he asked. Despite being a slobbery mess, I managed to say, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Doll, I promise this cupola will be on every one of our homes, he declared. I love you, Bud Hample. Phew, he wiped his brow and crawled across the bed to sit next to me. Now, doll, Will you finally marry me?